we have one of the most engaged photographic lens arts think tank events I've ever been in, and uh, apparently it goes on like that every year. So uh, some of you will one day get there, I hope. Uh, our Bill Ewing are also cohorts in this, and there's some other former fellows here. Or, is it okay to call a woman a fellow in that regard? Sure. I don't know. Fella. Fella. <laughs> so, anyway, um, this is one of a number of events that are going on in this space every year, every week it seems. There's two going on this week. Uh, we will have a salon on Friday of all the graduate students put up everything they do just sort of haphazard and eclectically. It's a wonderful way to see some fresh work if anybody would like to join us on Friday evening, big bar and so on and so forth. We have our annual book fair marking our 30th anniversary coming up April 11th, 12th, 13th. There will be three lecture events throughout that period uh, with different panels. They will be announced. You can look on our website. And anybody who wants to be on our mailing list, please give us your email and we'll put you on. Uh, at the end, on Saturday afternoon, uh, Nora Khan will give a sort of, I guess, uh, inaugural lecture marking the first annual grant of what is called the Cross Purposes Creative Writers Grant. It's a $15,000 grant. We had judges from all around the country, world actually, 14 judges, nominate people, and then it was, she was unanimously selected by a distinguished group of three judges. And this grant will occur every year, sponsored by this department, the school, and the Cross Purposes Foundation to engage and to encourage creative, critical, and historical writing in the field of photography and works-based arts. So she's a remarkable person, and we'll send anybody further information. So all of that PR done. Now I'd like to do the PR for this gentleman. Uh, Mario is a photographer, bookmaker, artist. I don't separate any of these categories. Uh, there's something on there, he says he's conceptual, but he's also documentary. All those terms, as many of the students know, mean nothing to me. We're just talking about creating work, creative thinking. And Mario's the epitome of that. He's been making artist books, I guess that I use that term, somewhere out here. And hopefully you all get to browse them if they'll let you touch them. And for a long time. He's in collections of the Museum of Modern Art, a number of German museums, major book collections, and photography-based collections. What's interesting about Mario is he's always been interested in sort of the alternative process, in the low-key mechanical process, including Xerox, and electromagnetic, other kinds of things. And this is a tradition that goes back to the 1970s, and everybody starts thinking, oh, no one did anything like that to the digital processes came along. Well, they were partially digital themselves. And um, that's what's very exciting about it. He believes in making narratives and visual narratives irrespective of the process and using what's available to him. And that could be altered mechanically or ink-wise, however he whimsically decides to alter it. But his work is also based in a political dialogue, concerned about racism, concerned about terrorism, and a whole number of other concerns, frankly, that tragically afflict, afflict us all. So with no further ado, oh, I forgot to mention one thing. As I said, Mario is one of the founders of this wonderful Cody place. And anybody who happens to go to Italy might want to look him up. It's, that's worth a visit to see the real thing and the real place and the origins of these books. So, thank you.
Thank you, Charles, for a wonderful introduction. I have learned a lot about myself as well. Thank you for that. And I also want to thank Liz Russo for uh, her very attentive and patient support in organizing this um, presentation. And um, I, I mean, I am not an academic. I'm not used to give lectures. And I'm not talking in my native language, so if for any reason you don't understand anything I'm saying, or if you want to bring my attention in a different direction, please feel free to interrupt me and ask any question you might have. And um, I also would like to uh, thank uh, Richard Grossbart here sitting in the first row, because some of the pictures you will see in this presentation, he is the photographer, and he's a great one, so I'm very thankful to him as well. And um, I brought pretty much of my work, uh, and I have displayed it here for, and uh, so I, I like, feel free to have a uh, touch, no white gloves needed. So just go through any of these works, and if you have any question about the technical process or why it has been made or how it has been made or when, I'm here happy to answer your questions. I know in New York, uh, you as students have uh, plenty of uh, opportunities and exposure to great artists and exhibitions and uh, being in such a great school like this one, where I actually took some classes as well in, I think it was 93, something. So I have had my own experience in this institution and, and that has been a very important part of my training. Uh, I'm not trained as a photographer, I'm not trained as an artist. Those were workshops I took after I had finished my university which I was in anthropology. So I thought I want, I had been working as, a, as an assistant to photographers for many years, but I had never had a formal uh, training as, a, as an artist or as a photographer. So I thought that was missing, even though I, I had learned a lot working as an assistant, hands-on project, I thought I would need a little bit more of a technical. So I did one class here and one on ICP. And um, so, what, uh, so what I wanted to say is that even though in New York you have so, much, so many opportunities, maybe you'll find something here as well. Um, there are some works uh, that I have produced which involve some quite elaborate uh, process, uh, pretty much <coughs> craft, craft work. Uh, as an Italian, uh, craft is very, very strong in my, in my work, working process. Um, um, Charles mentioned the conceptual work, uh, which is obviously something I'm very interested in, conceptual work. But I'm more, my main uh, focus is is craft, do, being able to do things, uh, choosing materials, uh, collaborating with other craftsmen. So I think of myself much more as a craftsman than as an artist. I still have to exactly figure out what being an artist means, but it's, I'm, I can figure out much clearly what being a craftsman is. So here you see different stages of, of projects. Some have been finished and are um, completely uh, accomplished. Some are at the very early stage of their production. So um, I would say that, uh, that uh, seeing the different, the, this whole a range of, of situation uh, can be very enriching as for uh, someone who is being who is studying to be a filmmaker, a photographer, or a, 
or a bookmaker, as, as Charles said, uh, uh, this is about uh, creative thinking and, and uh, produ producing work. So it doesn't really matter what will be your uh, final, uh, the final outcome of your creativity, because after all, the, the, the process that generates artistic work is the same whatsoever you do. You learn technicalities and skills, but the, this uh, kind of uh, curiosity, frustration, and researching is very similar. It's kind of uh, um, being uh, intellectually sleepless um, and, and uh, having this uh, uh, struggle and, and energy to do things. And um, I have made a, an ex I was trying to, I was talking about this subject with, a, with someone and, and I, had, I couldn't really, I, did, I had the feeling I was not understood, so I made a very simple example that, I, that turns out to be very, very effective. And that's like the same feeling that you have when you uh, have lost the keys inside your apartment and you don't find your keys. And so you have you look for the keys. You know they are there, and you finally find them. It's a little. I I have this kind of uh, this um, kind of feeling about my work. I, I'm searching for something, researching, but also just searching for something. When I find it, I knew it was there, and it's there, and it and it happens to exist at some point. So I'm gonna go on with the slides because um, that's what I'm supposed to do. So. Um, this one you have seen plenty. Okay, I wanted to show you where I come from because my Italian background and living in Italy is uh, a big part of my, my personality and approach to artistic work. And in other words, to be more explicit, uh, I am very conservative about art and, um, and very skeptical about uh, Art, which is uh, which most of the art I see, uh, uh, especially when I travel outside of Italy. Um, these pictures here are uh, about the Toddy Circle, which is the reunion that uh, Charles was describing. I'm going to talk about that later because that might also interest you at some point of your future career. And um, so, um, uh, you might know, you might recognize this gentleman here at the center and some other who have been uh, our guests. And, um, but then, okay, this is a, a little bit of the, I thought the, the environment would help. I'm always very interested, I mean, I think everybody's very, is interested in uh, where an artist lives, what he does, what is the context where he lives, uh, apart from the work that he does. I think artists are not aware of the fact on how much they are influenced. I think that's not relevant, but at the end of the day, what everybody wants to know is what you had for breakfast or, or um, how your apartment looks like, because it's a kind of a natural curiosity, and little objects are, are incredibly influential. I'm coming from, from Mexico, uh, and I have seen some studios, and I mean, apart from art in studio, when, when you look at the work, and you also want to look at the, the, the space. And so that I brought this based on this uh, reflection. This is, so this is my studio, and uh, I thought apart from uh, appreciating the mess, uh, it would be useful to have an, a, a, like a random general uh, uh, mix, a gigantic mix of iconographies. Um, I didn't really set it up uh, because I was taking the picture. It's just the way it looks uh, whatever day you walk in the space. And uh, I thought for some reason, I thought it would be, it could be interesting to, to show this. And I'm gonna move forward. And okay, for example, when I was talking about pub, this is a guy in Bevania who I, I collate, collaborate with this man, and he makes uh, part of the paper 
that I use for I use his paper, the paper he makes for some of the projects I do, and uh, of the same uh, the same kind of of um, of situation like this very uh, anachronistic and and um, and surprising I would say. Uh, kind of collaborations are very important to me because I like to switch from the cutting edge uh, uh, latest uh, printing technology combined with papers that have been made for the last 700 years because what he makes has been, been making for 700 years. So combining, combining the, like, like having this cross time um, a relationship with with uh, craft is, is is part of my artistic language, and so I, I work with this guy, and I work with another one who is a binder, and 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 another one who is um, who likes prints, uh, screen printing. It's not really a medieval technique, but it's something that was very strong in the 70s, and then the, the printing, the xeroxing is a big part of my work. Actually, the combination, I would say that the three steps of the production of my work are the, the subject, so photography and, and, and the subject in the pho photograph, which can be also appropriation or graphic work, and then the, the paper, the printing and the presentation. So these are the four steps of the work. And in, in each one of those, um, I, I collaborate with different people. And ironically, I think that the, the least importance is the first one, because I'm not very interested in the subject. I'm not trying to tell stories or, or show something. I'm more interested in the process. The process is kind of a, of a, of a mantra. It's kind of a therapeutic uh, activity because it, it just, I, if I think why I do it, I do it because it makes me feel better. It makes me feel good. I don't have other objectives than just doing something that makes me feel good. If I spend one day in my studio or if I visit someone like like this guy, I just feel good at the end of the day. If I do something else, I don't feel that good. So I obviously, for a natural uh, uh, thing, I, I, I do it. <laughs> and um, so moving forward, um, this is um, something I wanted to show you. Uh, this, I, apart from doing my books and my exhibitions and such like that, I like to, to I'm a little bit hyperactive, so I do also put together projects, uh, and this one was one of those. Uh, myself and a friend of mine uh, found thousands of IDs and, and, uh, and ID sheets like this, where you have uh, the basic uh, information about uh, one person. And these were lost in the archives of the city of Todi. And um, we thought it was an incredible um, uh, database of, of, of information about the local culture. And I had always been interested in photo IDs. And so this was perfectly matched with my interests. Um, in a way, this was also uh, interesting because of the uh, subject of massive data collection which is changing our society in our day. So this was kind of a dinosaur form of profiling people. And so we, thought we, we put together this little exhibition. And um, well, the reason I'm showing you this is because I think it's interesting by itself, but it's also uh, it's a good way to, to uh, show some other works that I will show you later. And um, it's the, the fact that photo IDs are the strongest, um, um, I would say, the strongest definition of photography. There is, I think there is a, a lot of confusion. Like, at least I am very confused about photography and its definition and its functions and its philosophical reasons. 
and the more time passed by, the more the, there is confusion. And, uh, and so I thought, what, what is the bottom line of that? And I think photo IDs are bottom line and are a great uh, way of, of uh, analyzing the, the, this medium. So um, I had always, I, if I look at my work, photo IDs have been everywhere. And these were, for example, two, three, dif three different projects that I've done with the same um, <coughs> with the same body of work. This was a, the one on top of the right was a little it was an installation. I had made like a little chapel. Uh, it was like a, a religious art in Italy, and so. The, different artists had been invited in uh, to put together some work and um, the one of the center and bottom there was a club and then up there was a was a, a theater performance so and now this work that is almost 20 has been sitting in the old the, has been sitting in my studio for i don't know 20 years and then I had, and I had plenty of these because these are big pieces of. This is just a small part of it. So I, I, I'm now working on on a edition of those. I'm using a machine. I'm very fascinated. I, in, in a previous life, I must have been a printer because uh, anything that has to do with ser seriality, seriality like a reproduction, fast fast reproduction, fascinates me. So there are these big machines that fold papers and are mostly used to make copies for copies of architectural drawings. And there is this big machine where you put the roll in it and it folds it. Boom, 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 boom. And so I'm folding all these, uh, all these uh, long uh, pieces of paper and the result is over there. And then I, I, I sew it with a sewing machine. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm, this is, I'm still working on it, but I'm very... I brought it because I'm very, it's what, I, what I've been doing this like the week before I came here. So it's still cooking, but I, I wanted to bring what's cooking, not just what is cooked. So the, the, this is, this. Um, and what I, I, the other thing that uh, also interests me lately are, are timbri. How do you say this? When you go to a post office and you stamps. So I am designing stamps. And I have designed these uh, stamps uh, with ants. Uh, ants are ants, so the combination of ants and photo IDs is my interest now. And uh, the reason of, you probably have to ask the reason to my shrink, but I try to, to describe it myself. And it's like the, the, the fact that um, I, I have, I had I have a friend who is an artist. He's older than me, so he kept. He was also an ethologist, so he was studying the, uh, the behavior of animals. So he always he, one of the things he kept repeating is that uh, humans are the only mammals that behave like insects. And I and this is something that is very much in the back of my mind when I observe. Uh, patterns of behavior of, of mankind, like if you go in the subway or uh, humans enjoy being one on top of the other, hiding holes and uh, excavating holes and hiding into it. They really behave like ants, but they are not insects, they are supposed to be mammals. So this kind of uh, uh, massive, uh, this kind of process uh, fascinates me. And, and so I kind of, I, I'm, I'm seeing the result of, of these two different uh, images together. Uh, these are different papers. Of course, you cannot appreciate the, the texture um, of, the, of the print uh, with a projection, but I, that's why I enlarge it like this. These are all handmade paper. I don't use only super fancy papers. I also use wrapping paper. I use all sorts of paper. I don't have. A, I don't need to have a paper, handmade paper, or rice paper, or Japanese paper. Or, I, I like it. I love paper in, in any different uh, uh, form. 
but the, the, it doesn't have to be. Sometimes it's more. It's very interesting to have a cheap paper, super, and which is a re reminiscence of pop art or in the Italian art, the povera, to use poor materials. And sometimes uh, restrictions or limitations is is what an artist needs to to stress his creativity. Uh, if you have everything at your disposal, uh, it's it's great, but it's is not what happened. It's not reality. Most times you have limitations in budget, in materials, in time, in space, in everything, and you have to make something out of it. So, so um, yeah, but this has nothing to do with this. I just diverted. Anyways, uh, the result, this texture that you see on the paper is because this kind of paper is not flat. It's like wrinkle, has wrinkles. It's a soft paper. And when I print with uh, Xerox, um, I, I use all sorts of different Xerox machines. Uh, this is a large format. Um, I, the, the, the toner only goes on the part of the paper which is more, uh, which is above, like doesn't go in the, where the wrinkles are. So the image, the original image is, uh, is flat. But by printing with that machine on that paper, um, it's uh, the, it, it, you don't when you see the final result, you don't understand. It's not understandable why it comes. And this is the result of a lot of testing. And I also another technique that I have developed is uh, how to present this kind of works because um, the paper when you use papers which are so thin, you can't really. How do you display it? If you want to make a, so I, I, the solution to this problem was using a technique which is uh, originally made for for uh, restoration and is made for to preserve further deterioration of ancient papers and it's it's mounting the the paper on a linen canvas with acid free um, glue. And I brought one piece uh, because I think this is a this is a great uh, thing. I mean, it's great to show works on paper. And I I have been living in New York for six months uh, a few years ago, and I wanted to do some some works like that. I couldn't find anywhere they had. They, they look at me as if I was a, a lunatic. They just what are you talking about? It's just not. It does. It's only done in Italy. It's uh, well, we are uh, obviously the the homeland of restoration, and, and we have techniques which are very developed. Uh, but here they had no clue. So if you wanna, if you're interested, I think it's a great solution. And this canvas can then go on a stretcher. And the result, the final result is very, in my opinion, has, in my experience, has been very satisfactory. Um, I print with, uh, now this is a recent machine that prints white. Now, Printing in white is now back in fashion, but for there has been a blackout of 20 years. For 20 years, there was no commercial printing equipment that printed in white. I have been printing in white with 20 years ago, 20 years ago, and I kept the machine that printed in white. It was an offing machine, nothing complicated. And then there was a blackout. Now white is all over. When you see white printed on black, 99% is screen printing which is a great technique. I love screen printing, but screen printing is, is flat. I mean, you don't have different textures in the white. It's white or black. So while with this one, you have different uh, nuance. You say nuances? Mm -hmm. Nuances, and, and, and uh, that's what I'm looking for, nuances. I, I do screen printing and I like it, but it's, it's different. So for example, if you want, as a student, if you have a question about which machine does that kind of printing, or if you have a project that you are researching on which equipment could, uh, or which mounting, or which whatever paper would work, I'd, I'd be happy to answer your question now, or later if you want my contact information, you can ask Liz. I'd be happy to, to give you all the information you want, if I'm saying something that that uh, rings a bell or, or could answer some questions. Now, this is the first slide of a, of a previous pro. Actually, 
this is like a trilogy and I made this trilogy this trilogy is, is a kind of a political work but not uh, it's like an iconography iconographical research uh, on uh, on um, um, these are not IDs but like our governmental images of uh, uh, men which are in the history three of the four are dead um, and this is also a work in process the, the work is sitting there on that table and uh, the same, so you can see the, the what I was talking about this, this paper and how the, the, the um, print the printing technique uh, um, matches with the quality of the paper it gives this sense of uh, of being ruined, of, of having a, a history, and, and I'm very interested in that, in like uh, having a, give, have, doing works that are not clearly, um, it's not easy to date them, it's not easy to say this was made in, it, it gives a little bit of a, a you need a, 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 an extra effort to understand if it's a contemporary work, if it's old, if it's something in between, I find this very, very interesting. So this was previous work. Um, in this case, I have used uh, uh, black recycled paper, which is uh, available anywhere and very cheap. And I have also used uh, transparencies. Unfortunately, the, the pictures of the transparencies are not very, don't really uh, show the, the, the work. Um, what is, what, uh, it's another part of my research is uh, optical art. So using different forms and, and uh, optical effects. It's a very 70s uh, re reminiscence of the art of the 70s and, um, and uh, it continues. This is another, this is also on transparency and the screen printing. The Eagle is a work of uh, De Pero, um, which is a futurist Italian artist, uh, and it's made with a, street, a silver screen print printing. This work is, is on the table as well. Um, I was very, I liked the, the graphic design of this work, how the, the history of, this is the, the history is the history of the birth of Rome um, this era of art of um, architecture uh, was very much about uh, um, connecting uh, with the Roman Empire and its grandiosity and I kind of played a little bit with it the guy he, so I put the skateboarder there to make it a little bit more um, um, affordable in a way visually and um, and so this is this is printed uh, this is at that time I used to make uh, larger editions of my <coughs> books um, I had um, I had more ambitious about ambitions about the sale of the artists books then I realized it's a little bit more complicated than I thought so I made smaller and smaller editions and so that works better and um, so this trilogy is part of, of like this uh, research on different icons. The, the, the symbol you see top uh, left is, a, is, a, is a, I found that in, in the archives of Eur. Eur is this neighborhood in the south of Rome. And that's the fascio, it was the, is the, where fascism comes from. So, this was a Roman, from the ancient Roman Empire symbol that this was reused later. And I found that and I found it very graphically, very interesting. Um, this is, uh, this, is uh, an, uh, this work is, uh, this entire book, uh, there is known of my, it's only appropriation. I didn't do, while the other books were photo, my own photographs, uh, this is uh, this is on all appropriation and uh, graphic design. The printing technique is the same as the previous one. Um, the only difference is uh, the back of the cover. 
which is printed in um, um, like the, I don't know how to say in English, but it's like uh, the, the the way you used to print before digital uh, printing was available. Let's put it like this. So how books were made uh, 20 years ago, and this is also screen printing. Uh, in this case, I used. Uh, blue paper. Um, this book was uh, is named. Um, the subject is New York. I made this book while I was living here, and that was during the, the Bush Junior era. And uh, so I thought at that time this country was in a very decadent time, and I thought of uh, a little bit the icons of New York, the, the landmarks of New York like archaeological sites. It, it's uh, living in, I've been living in Rome for many years, so you live surrounded by, by archaeology. And for some, somehow I, I was looking at New York with the same uh, eyes. Uh, everything looked very um, like this, this. This is the New York Stock Exchange, as you can tell. And so the Guggenheim is the cover there. And uh, that's a Brooklyn Bridge, the Washington Bridge, like all the, the landmarks where, like you see here. I'm sorry, the, the, I don't know if the quality of the projection is uh, well enough, but as I said before, the books are there. So if we have time, I mean, you can, you can look at this stuff in real. Um, this is my first work with uh, Xeroxing. This is a machine that prints in four different colors, which are white, black, red, and blue. And uh, the purple is the result of uh, um, two layers, one red and one blue, but one color at the time. And then um, and um, I've made two different portfolios. Um, I, 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 I was not aware of the fact that red and white, black are so present in my work. I, I've seen it now by putting the, the works over there. And um, I made, uh, this is a, as I said before, I like to play, to have some uh, anachronistic uh, uh, images. So I took the, the most famous sites of the city where I lived at that time, that was Rome, and uh, transformed them, but keeping them, keeping them as everybody knows. I mean, I, I don't show anything new uh, when I show Sam Speeder. I wanted to, that's, and, and what I said before is that I'm not interested in the subject. I, I'm, I, want to, I want the observer of the work not to put his interest on the subject, but to put his interest on the process, on the treatment that it has had. And, um, and so that's why I use images which are universally known, because uh, this does, um, unless you lived on the moon, you know the Pantheon or you know Piazza Navona. And so you don't have any interest in the, retro in, in the documentation of the place itself. I want the interest to go on, on the materi, on, on the, and on the process, and on the language. And in this case, uh, it's also like a, a quote of, in, I, I like to quote other artists, and one of the, art, uh, the artists I'm quoting here is Piranesi, which was a great printer and an incredible artist of the uh, uh, early 18th century, uh, or late, uh, I mean 18th century. And, and he was making these, uh, these uh, portfolios. It's actually the, the how photography first, yeah, here is Piranesi. And he, he was, um, uh, a great printer, and I, I really like his work and how how he presented. These places don't exist. He just made up places, and uh, or, or he combined places that existed with, uh, uh, and somehow he was also manipulating uh, uh, his uh, the images he was uh, presenting, and. Um, I, I love his work, it's just amazing. So now I'm going to show you another three or four slides uh, that are uh, showing artists that have influenced me. Uh, Bruno Munari 
is um, it was a very well is very well known in Italy. He has made many many book. He invented the modern concept of of um, of artist book. He was also a, a minimalistic. He worked a lot with uh, with uh, simple forms. As you can see, one of his most famous books is this one, Square, Circle, and Triangle. And I, I, I also enjoy very much using the, the, these simple forms that have an incredible, strong, symbolic power. Um, each of those images, in its simplicity, uh, activates uh, a lot of uh, neurons, I would say. And which neurons, I don't know, but they certainly do do make uh, create a strong emotional response, and and, and I find this extremely interesting. Uh, Luigi Veronesi, he was a pure photographer, but I, the the type of photographer that I feel closer to. So a photographer that whose work is on the medium itself. Is not using the medium. Is not uh, um, doing uh, something with the medium. Is just self auto referential self self referencing his work to his work in a way. So doesn't need to exit the studio. Doesn't need to exit the 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 dark room. Uh, everything is there. And because it's the, the object of his work is the medium itself. And I have had, always had this, uh, this relationship with photography. I, I, I'm not really interested in taking pictures, but I am interested in, in photography itself. Um, someone said, Gary Winograd said, uh, photography is not about taking pictures. And I strongly believe in that. It's, it's part of, and here as well, you see, simple forms, the triangle, the circle, and, and others, textures. This is uh, what fascinates me, this minimalistic, symbolic work, to try to create a, an emotional response with minimal um, stimulation, let's say. And it's, it's all over my, my work, uh, I try to not put I, I prefer to have one one element less than one element too much in the work. Um, Franco Angeli, this is more a conceptual work. He was very much into into symbolism. Uh, he kept repeating the same uh, images for all along his uh, his career. Um, he worked a lot with the American icons. And, and not only, this is the so-called Italian pop art, and um, and it's very influential to me, and I think to any Italian artist, uh, to the any day. So this is the EU, which is the sub, the neighborhood that I have uh, uh, I've made a book about. I show you the the images a few slides before, and this is De Pero, it's a futurist. Futurist artist. He also made books. Um, he, he I just I'm totally crazy for his work, and um, I, I I suggest you look at at futurist art. Futur Italian futurist art is a very very. I, I think it, it would influence any any artist for. Um, and then I have uh, I have put here. A few pictures of exhibitions I have made um, because this is uh, when I was uh, when I was preparing this uh, this presentation I f ended up making a gigantic collage of my life so I thought I would also I started with showing where I live and and uh, and now this is a little bit uh, what I do the outcome of my work is uh, is are the books and and the editions. And, but also exhibitions. So I, this is just a few many exhibitions I've done. I don't have the pictures. I was too busy doing preparing the show, and then uh, and uh, so I never took pictures of the installation. This uh, over there is a series of work uh, which are uh, 
black toner on black recycled paper. And this is a wrapping paper, so the, the wrapping paper comes folded when you buy it. It's like one dollar a piece. It's a, what we use to make packages to ship stuff. And I, I print on it. And this is then mounted on canvas and the canvas on a stretcher. And um, so, well, I couldn't bring the original work, but I tell you it's a great way to display works. This was another project, the, the, another exhibition about the Eul, the one, uh, in a beautiful space near Rome. And um, this was in Germany. Uh, I titled, I gave the title to this exhibition of the obsessive copying disorder, because I think I suffer from this uh, disease. And um, because everything I see, I need to copy and I need to make multiple copies. Huh? I don't know why, um, but I thought, and this was, uh, this exhibition was in this um, uh, space where they only show art made with Xerox. And um, so it was very interesting. I've met many artists who work with this medium, but it's coming back um, and allows, it's interesting because, um, now, our days, it's completely obvious to be able to see the result of your work immediately. If you use digital tools, uh, it, it's nothing uh, surprising that you see it right away. But uh, only copy machines allowed, Xeroxing allowed this. So the, the real uh, feedback you have on your work and going back and forth from producing scene, producing scene, and at this is something that uh, um, made the, me, this medium interesting, and somehow it's the, the, like the, the ground of, the, of it is uh, it's immediately and in a, being very in a, inexpensive as well. Um, this is the same exhibition. Uh, we had also some workshops with students who played with uh, Xeroxing. The schools came in, and it was a lot of fun, I must say. It's such an intuitive, intuitive uh, uh, working process that, uh, that, I mean, anyone played with a copy machine in his uh, childhood. Someone continue and become uh, artists or, or professionals, some just change and do something else. Um, another exhibition, These are the, this is the same technique of the uh, faces you have seen before, so long, uh, pieces of paper. Um, so this, this is an exhibition which is actually now on, on uh, display. It's in Buffalo. Um, and it's also about copy art. Uh, the work that I'm showing is that one. And that's the Capitol Hill uh, of, of Houston. Um, and it's uh, made by many uh, I passed, I, I printed several times on the same piece of paper. So the, the work at the end, uh, if you look at it like this, you don't realize what, what makes it interesting is that the more times the toner has passed in the same spot, <coughs> the more makes it glossy, while the rest of the print is, uh, is uh, matte. So you have many, many levels from being completely matte to being very glossy, and this makes the work very three-dimensional. And um, you can't appreciate it here, but if you try to do it, if you find some machine and you try to go on and on and on and print, you would see the result is very, very interesting. And then I, want, I, I found this in my Googling around, and uh, I thought this uh, was uh, a good way to end my presentation uh, because I truly believe in this. And I also, so now, as it seems like we have another few minutes, uh, I wanted to tell you more about the body circle, which is this um, reunion uh, that we have every year. There are several fellows. Uh, in the, uh, today here in this room, um, um, and this is 
the genesis of me being here today as well, so I thought it was important to talk about. It is about what I was saying before, the fact that there is a lot of confusion about photography uh, for the simple reason that the technical developments uh, that this uh, uh, medium has had in the past 10 years, switching from chemical photography to, to digital photography, and I don't say analogic because it's not analogic. And there is this uh, myth of, I mean, this, I think it's a mistake to call photography before digital analogic because it's not analogic. Uh, analogic is a, an electromagnetic process. Uh, it was chemical, a chemical process. Everybody calls it analogic, but it's not an analogic process. So it's a mistake. So I, I call it chemical photography. Uh, switching to digital photography. Um, and, and, and this group of, of uh, uh, different people with different backgrounds and professions, photographers, uh, dealers, collectors, curators, as you can read, get together and, and, and talk about uh, what, uh, what is uh, going on, uh, what has happened recently, and most important what how they see the future so it's a, it's a very metaphysical kind of, of reflection and uh, and um, uh, trying to fantasize uh, on, on the future of this medium and uh, everyone brings his own experience and adds pieces to it so it ends up with some interesting reflections um, it's obviously doesn't produce any concrete result, it's just pure intellectual speculation. But everybody seems to be very much in need of that, and because in the easy life and, and, and very, um, let's say, hands-on, day-by-day activities of everyone, uh, the lack of sitting together in a room and talking about ideas seems very much empty in, in most people's life and people uh, miss that. So that's why we have, uh, that's what was the idea that uh, generated this project that seems a little, seemed a little bit crazy at the beginning, but it turns out to be doing very well. Uh, we are now uh, slowly uh, organi trying to organize also um, projects that will involve uh, uh, younger people because the, the groups we have organized are more pretty much uh, established professionals in the field of photography but we are also we want to include uh, and um, also uh, younger people who are just came out from college or schools or other institutions so that's another reason for for uh, you, if you want to get in touch and learn more, I'd be happy to give you information. And now I want to uh, invite you to this uh, group show uh, that will uh, open on April 6th, as you can see, uh, mm -hmm. in a gallery in Chelsea on 27th Street. Uh, Miyako <coughs> is here today. And it's, gonna, it's a, the 20th anniversary. with a little bit of self-promotion, obviously. And um, but I'd be very pleased to have you if you like to come to this exhibition. You're gonna see some seriously good photography. And um, I've been very criticized by my friends because I wanted to put this cheesy. And uh, someone told me not even in a pizzeria in Piazza Navona they would put something like that. And I said that's exactly why I wanted. I want to reinforce the Italian cliché, so I put this grazie, and I thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions, please. Um, 
So you said you're really not interested in subject matter, and that what you're interested in is the process. Well, clearly there's a consistency of you know, subject matter that appears and reappears in what you've shown. So maybe you can talk about why you choose, even though you're not interested. You know, a or, you know, the kind of pop symbolism of totalitarian regimes, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Well, thank you for, for this question. I'm, I'm not aware of it. I am, um, I, I mean, I am, I acknowledge the fact that there is a consistency um, but is I don't I cannot explain it really. Um, I and it's just instinct, um, and you I don't I'm not really interested in uh, rationalizing my instinct. So one thing that I have noticed in uh, in um, deal in, in having a working and artistic relationships with art schools is how good students are in um, explaining their iconography and uh, the images that they show. And uh, so you, you see these students that uh, you kind of push a button and they go like blah, 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 blah for 20 minutes and they explain you Every, any any detail of, of the images that they show, and uh, most times is actually not really interesting, but that's because probably they are the beginning of their work. But what's interesting is how much importance is given to, to this. And this probably is uh, thought to them to make their artistic life, life easier. But that's not a solution because uh, uh, you never have a real answer. The answer is not, I don't think there is a real awareness of the reason why you paint trees or you photograph uh, uh, lakes or, or you make sculptures or you make movies about, uh, I don't know what, your childhood. Uh, there is this, uh, uh, in, in, say, instance, uh, this, this, this instance. There is this need to be satisfied, but it's 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 not rational, and it's not ra it shouldn't be rationalized. So it should be left mellow and confused. Um, so to answer your question, I I wish someone tells me why I do it because I don't know. <laughs> I have a couple of questions. What, um, first of all, that group of identity photographs from Todi. Mm. Who was that group? Were the, they the people? particular people, or was it a uh, regional population? Uh, hold on, I'm not sure. So we talk about that. I took the picture of that. Yeah. Yes. Um, these were the, when people went to the town hall to get their ID, they had to bring two photo IDs, and then they had to tell where they lived, if they were married, their job, and blah, 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 the, the hair color and things like that. And so the town hall collected this uh, data sheet uh, and issued the, the document. Um, so this was all the town of the municipality of Todi. What we have done, and it was an enormous, it was over 20 years, so we had boxes and boxes. Actually, a friend of mine is the director of the historical archive of the city of Todi. So at the, I mean, the office where they make the, the where they make IDs, at some point, we didn't need these boxes any longer because now everything is digital. So they come and say, take these boxes, so otherwise we throw it away. And they were sitting in this room with uh, dust on it and everything. And, and when, I found, when I saw them, I, I was very interested. So to answer your question, uh, we, to, to give, uh, to make, to, to narrow down the thing, because it was so huge, we took all the people from one single hamlet, which is the hamlet where my friend Umberto lives. 
and, uh, we, and those, those were 96 people. So we showed that all of the 96 people that in year X uh, asked for an ID, and then all, and that some were still alive, like this woman, <laughs> what? there, and, and uh, most were not, but their kids were there, and there was a lot of gossip because of <laughs> it was very interesting, very anthropologically, very, very active. And um, so it's interesting because there's such a resonance with so many collections of such ID photos that have such a darker story mm. to tell. Yes. The pleasurable aspect of this being a community is, yes. you know, that's why I had to ask. I was really yeah, no, that's very true. Most times you yeah, see these are... Something Unfortunately, people that yeah. have not had uh, nice experiences, let put it like this. Uh, but in this case, they were all happy and uh, okay. eventually <coughs> still around and having a good time in Umbria with Mama. No, with Mama, no. Just a word on where they're shown. Ah, yes. Uh, the place where it's shown is a former church that is now being transformed. It's a private space, um, and it's used for exhibitions, for readings, for music, and it's in a friend's house, and it's actually where we have our final dinner of the Toddy Circle. On, on, on the last day, as you can see there, we have our dinner, so it's not only about culture. Well, it's also gastronomic culture as well happens in that room. <laughs> yeah. Any second question? I didn't want to hog the microphone. Um, what is the emotional relationship to Aeor in Roman people today? Young the web? Excuse me. Aeor. Ah. What is their, uh, what is the, you know, I, I went there with you when I yes. was in Rome with the RISD yes. group and you gave we, us a tour. And I've never uh, forgotten it. Holly is a, was a, um, from RISD. Um, she was a, with a group of students for a semester in Rome. And we met at an opening of some of, of an exhibit group exhibition where Holly had one of her beautiful paintings. And so somehow we started talking, and then I, she has seen my work on, on Eur. But what, if any student wants to come and have a look, it's now a good time because... Um, so we decided to bring the students at Eur. And I gave this little tour of a neighborhood. And uh, just pretending I knew more than I did because I didn't really know, but, but it, ended, it, it, it went well. I think the most interesting part of that day was the students looking at me eating. Do you remember that, Holly? Yes. Now, if you want, you can explain why, but this is not about the presentation. Um, it's, um, the relationship is controversial because as it is controversial, the relationship with all uh, fas art produced during the ta fascist time. I don't say fascist art because artists were not politically involved. They were just doing their job and uh, for the most part. And um, so what has been produced in those years uh, is uh, uh, remarkable. And uh, of course, there are reminiscences of, of, of what has happened in, in Italy in those years. And many people are, are um, including myself, are, um, have um, like uh, mixed feelings about it. Uh, and uh, mixed more on the side of criticism. But uh, today is, uh, is, a, is a neighborhood which is widely used for shootings of commercial movies. You see it all the time. They make photo shooting there constantly because it has this, uh, this um, scenographic. It's like a gigantic set. It's a natural set and works beautifully for, for for photographing and filming. So, well, in Rome, people have other uh, problems in these days than uh, uh, speculating on the uh, 
genesis of uh, the neighborhood. They wanted to do the Formula One uh, uh, competition there, but then they changed their mind because there were too many holes in the streets, and it was too complicated. They didn't have the funds. And now, just one little reason: the reason we were looking at the, the American students were looking at me eating because we went to eating like in a buffet, and I made my plate. And I put one thing here, one thing here, one thing here, and one thing here. Well, the student just made a little mountain of, of food completely. So, just... <laughs> I don't know, it has these funny memories about it. That's what I remember the most. I have a question. Um, so, you seem to have a very particular aesthetic style in terms of, like, visuals, but I'm wondering at what point you think about the book itself, or if it's unbound, like at what point do you think about how it comes together? Mm. Well, um, this is a, it's a good question, and thank you for that. Um, it, it's usually, I first make a portfolio, and, uh, as, and uh, some portfolios are here, and uh, because I have this natural, uh, mm, it's, I like uh, the, the process of printing, so I make several prints. And, and making several prints ends up at first sight in a portfolio. Then I, I wait for, for, I don't like this. <laughs> Um, it's, it's a matter of time. Um, I don't start with the idea of making a book. I start with some curiosity on some specific kind of visuals. And then I allow enough time to understand if it's just a, a temporary interest or if it has a longer span. And if it has a longer span, then it, it kind of evolves naturally in a, in a book. I, I'm kind of prolific, and I change my interest very much, uh, which is not good for, for, it's not considered to be good for an artist. The, the usually, uh, artists who work on the exact same thing for decades are seen as being more uh, um, better than those that have a more um, mixed uh, production. Um, but I don't want to narrow my, my, my instinct, as I said, by giving myself a discipline and continuing to do the same thing forever, because I just get bored. And I, I have Curiosity. So, because I know I'm aware of that, I give time and wait and see if this is something which has uh, the destiny to become uh, an important part of my artistic production, it becomes a book naturally. Otherwise, it just ends up in my archive in the mess you have seen before. Anyone else? Are you worried about Xerox machines uh, disappearing? Yes. They are. <laughs> they disappeared. They, they are disappeared. They are, they are they already disappeared right. because um, I actually collaborate uh, with one of the major manufacturers of uh, Xerox. Of, no, it started as a Xerox. It's called OCE. O -C -E, and it's a manufacturer that is in Holland. And they have been manufacturing, um, they are around uh, since uh, 1880. So they, they started as a company that was coloring food. They, they realized at that time in the industrial uh, era, in the industrial revolution, they realized that if corn was more yellow or if uh, whatever, tomato was more red, it sold better. Seems ridiculous. Today, but they are who found out that first, and they start producing the color for food. That's how it started the company. Then it went on and on, and today they print. They today they are the leaders in producing the on-demand books. 
and it's a machine which starts from here and ends up there, and, and you put a file in a computer, and on the other side comes out the book. And it, it's how you make books on, on, on demand. They are printed in Singapore, where, and then you get a FedEx, and like Blur, or, or think, I'm sure you're familiar with books on demand. You, 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 put, you make the file online, and then you, you send, you email or whatever, upload the file, and then you get the FedEx with the book, one copy or two copies or three copies at home. And it, some are very, it's not shitty small books, it's really beautiful hardcover books. And um, so I, I collaborate with them, they have a museum, and uh, they have a museum, of, they have been going through the entire history of printing technology. And um, they kind of uh, uh, give me attention for some reason, and uh, they allow me to use their machines. With, there are some volunteers in the museum, and they want to keep all those machines functioning. So if someone goes there with a good idea, like, oh, I want to use that machine for this and that reason, they allow that. And for me, that was a heaven. <laughs> and uh, this story to say that our day, Xerox is a charcoal, is an electrostatic process of uh, where thin uh, charcoal powder is deposited on paper and then is fixed. It's exactly the same process of photography because it's made with light. So the areas, you, we all know the light that scans. That is an electromagnetic, where the, where the original is dark, the electricity is plus, where it's white is minus. And then it goes in a drum, and it, the dust goes on the paper. And that's exactly what happens when you print light on a, on a, on a photographic paper. And then it has to be fixed. Uh, in photography, it's made with uh, chemicals, with, with the fixing part of the, of the printing process. In, in, uh, in, uh, in electrophotography, which is the original name of xeroxing, is made with, with an oven that cooks the charcoal that attaches to the paper. This technique is no longer around um, because inkjet is, uh, is much more economical and efficient. But it's nothing to do. I mean, I really don't like inkjet printing. I, I see the results are incredible. I see large enlargements of photographic pictures uh, made with inkjet are impressive, but it's dead. It looks dead to me. It, looks, it doesn't have that uh, doesn't have that energy in my eyes. I'm sure other artists will do great things with it, but it doesn't have that. There is no humanity. There is no human in it. It's just it's, there is no matter. It's just files. I don't think files are romantic or interesting. They are just files. So you put a file on a paper, and it's <laughs> uh, that's my. If I could just, uh, I, I've recently had a, a problem with some files. <laughs> <laughs> a big project I worked on for about 15 years about the image of fruit in Western culture. Long story short, through the years, the collection of images and texts and very original research done by Luigi Ballerini, you may know, um, accumulated in boxes, you know, file boxes, and then they got digitized through the different processes, from Saquis discs to all kinds of discs. And it recently, I looked at the disc and I realized we don't have anything to play the discs with. And uh, my landlord wanted to throw the original boxes out there, 20 office boxes and stuff. And we have spent days trying to find out who can reproduce from the discs a new file. We found it, found it. So what I'm, the point of the story is, to all of the art, young artists here who are working with whatever mechanism, and whatever machine, whatever Xerox, whatever Epson, whatever thing, 
maybe you ought to buy one and save it for the future because it's very likely you will not be able to reproduce what you did presently. And the Guggenheim Museum, by the way, in terms of a number of interactive artists, have also bought the appropriate uh, mechanism to go with things that they have bought that are digital. This goes back to 1990, actually. So it's, it's easy for a lot of young people to think, oh, it'll be around forever. No, it might not. So maybe buy the machine that you made it on. I just have one, one question. I'm sorry. Sorry. Sure. I know you don't want to be psychoanalytic about, about your own work, but you did mention that you studied anthropology. Um, and I wonder if you would say at least that that was some sort of fundamental part of your makeup. Yes. Um, Certainly yes, uh, because uh, I, when I was studying anthropology, um, I focused on one branch of anthropology, which is visual anthropology, and uh, that means uh, the two means two things. One is uh, how to um, use the images produced by a certain culture or ethnical group to study that group. So analyzing images produced by a group of people with a certain demographic uh, or geographical location. And um, the other one, part of this science is how to document, how to photograph and film a certain culture. So the methodological, which goes from like uh, people uh, taking uh, drugs together with uh, indigenous people and raving with them and taking pictures while they were raving, which was perfectly fine as far as you stated, it, to the more uh, like uh, formal uh, um, um, cold and detached uh, uh, approach. So this was part of my final dissertation. I, I was more in this, in the, not in the reading part, but in the more how to photograph a culture. And uh, in fact, I did my dissertation on Margaret Mead and Gregory Bateson when they went to Bali and photographed uh, the island and, um, and uh, the enormous uh, body of work to document family, uh, agriculture, uh, I don't know, uh, architecture, like all the different brand areas of, in which you can divide the culture. So, um, how this influences in my work, um, I think uh, gives me um, a sense of, of, uh, of um, awareness of the how how um, of me being a member of a certain uh, uh, civilization and uh, so seeing my work not only with uh, the uh, in the history of art I mean I don't, don't want to sound arrogant like placing my work in the history of art but uh, more seeing my work as an activity of a member of a human, specific part of human civilization somehow, com trying to communicate to, to other cultures. I, when I look at contemporary art, I, that's why I was saying, uh, I'm interested, at the beginning I was saying, I'm interested to see where an artist lives, the objects that surround him, and uh, where he comes from and such like that, because that helps me to see him with as, as a, a, say, a, a person producing images to, to as a, this, uh, his own description of his own culture, somehow. And so I, I have these, uh, these uh, two different 
ways of interpreting my own work and other artists' works that comes from my anthropological studies. Yeah. 